You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome to TV Guidance Counselor as we barrel through summer here. Hopefully you guys are staying cool, unless you're in Australia and then I think it's winter, but I think it's always summer in Australia and I can't envision them actually having winter. And I know some of you are listening from Australia, so feel free to email me at tvguidancecounselor at gmail.com, canadaicanread.com, at Kenneth W. Reader, at TV Guidance on the social media, or on the Patreon, patreon.com backslash tvguidancecounselor. And let me know what winter is like there. I'd always wanted to visit Australia. Uh, maybe someday. Now that the world is opened up again and I'm fully vaccinated, I hope you are too and you're staying safe. Anyway, that's a whole different conversation for a different day. Today's conversation is with my fantastic guest, Sarah Sweeney. And Sarah is a local New Englander originally, grew up in Rhode Island, uh, lives make, made her way to New York City to great success, does a ton of voiceover. You've absolutely heard her voice before. She... Uh, is a great follow on Twitter. If you want to follow her there, it's Hey Sarah Sweeney, Sarah with an H, uh, Sweeney with an E-Y. Uh, or she has a website called SweeneyProject.com. Her writing is on there. She's a great writer. You can check out her voiceover stuff there. Uh, she's just great. She had a podcast called The Latchkey Kids, uh, which I really, really loved as a fellow Latchkey kid. It was a uh, very, very uh, close to my heart. And we talk about that here as well, uh, in addition to a lot of other fun stuff. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of T. TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Sarah Sweeney. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time of need. Sarah Sweeney, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. You're in New York? It's New York. They, that's okay. how it's pronounced, yes. New York? Yeah, uh, I, forgot, I couldn't remember if you were New York or Connecticut because you grew up in Rhode Island, right? Yes, yes, I did. I grew up just outside of Providence, and uh, I've been here for too long. I think is the answer. I think that's what everyone who wasn't born in New York and lives in New York says about living in New York. <laughs> yes, accurate, accurate. New York's great, though. I mean, where else can you get a pizza at two o'clock in the morning and then get your nails done? You know, I mean, that's it's, true. It's a weird place. That's true. There, there's a lot of opportunities for regrets and bad decisions at all hours of the day. And that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm mostly talking about the pizza. Uh, every time I go down to New York, which is usually for like an audition that was soul sucking, I would end up. I don't know if this was good or bad, but I'd always find like a 24 hour diner and then just cake and pie my feelings away. Hell yeah. uh, so that, you know, that was good. <laughs> that is good. I mean, if you, if you ever want to skip the dining out experience, which we've all sort of done is, uh, yes. you know, Ben and Jerry's is the best ice cream to cry into. That is true, actually. Yeah. And like every gas station has Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> As a non-driver, I'm just going to write that down for future adventures. <laughs> There's nothing sadder slash more 21st century American than going to a 24-hour gas station after they've closed the store to patrons and where you have to ask the clerk to go get stuff for you. I don't know if you've oh, ever God. seen them. So Never like, in my they, life. <laughs> oh, man. So there's like maybe four hours where for some reason, like you can't go in the store part. So you have to go to the clerk who's behind glass and be like, can I, can you get me the Ben and Jerry's? And they go get it and put it through like a bank thing <laughs> and the, the plexiglass yeah, job like the drawer yes. and they have that drawer that comes out with like, yeah. so we it's have like, that at the post office here so it's like that but for like munchies and sad ice cream <laughs> it's <laughs> sad it's ice great. cream yeah you're like Get it in your freezer aisle that one no i want the th yeah it's it's uh but that's that's where we live in uh speaking of the world we live in and the mm -hmm. world we used to live in mm -hmm. uh, we've picked an issue here from october 1998 which is a halloween issue which is always exciting for me yes very i'm a and big it halloween like guy. the only scary parts of it were the clinton scandal of of the 1998 whenever i read about that it's later in the presidency than i remember it being <laughs> I feel like I was not in high school when that happened. Apparently I was. There were still like hearings until like 2000 or something. And I'm like, I mean, I up until was like I was 35. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's true. Um, really weird. Oh, Ron Clinton. Sorry. Oh, yes. No. Yes. There are many. Uh, no, they started Benghazi then before it even happened. They were just like preemptively. We want to harass this woman. Uh, <laughs> I see the future. <laughs> <laughs> something will happen. You know, I've gotten really into my horoscope in recent weeks because it's eerily spot on. 
I'm not really going anywhere with this story, but <laughs> but it'd be it'd be um, horrific, but real fascinating if if the news just started working off the, their horoscopes. Preemptive news from stories. the back of Seventeen magazine. This is the second issue you picked because actually I think we went ninety three at first, and then you were like, I don't remember this. I had hopes and dreams of talking about Animaniacs, <clears throat> and then I realized I just don't remember. Were you active? Do you have a lot of siblings? Were you out not watching? I am TV? an only child. I'm I'm a lonesome youth. I don't know where I was in 93. I feel like I would have been 11, so maybe after school daycare or something. <laughs> You're not hanging out at Lupo's? <laughs> not yet. Nice <laughs> reference, Providence. <Yes. laughs> Spent a lot of time in Rhode Island. <laughs> Amen. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was in a punk rock band in the 90s, and we used to play the Met and Lupo's called? a lot. We were called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. <laughs> Oh, we used to play with like Dropkick Murphys and all that kind of thing. Oh, you know, like major bands. Oh, well, it was just ridiculous Boston things. <laughs> I mean, my, my high school band that became actually famous, not my high school band, but the band of my high school was uh, Groovis Malt. Do you remember that vaguely? No. Ska band? Uh, yeah. That name just sounds ska band to me. So it's like, very Scottish. I think there's an umlaut in there somewhere. And then there was another band called uh, Monty's Fan Club, which like now the head guy, the front man, uh, tours with 30 Seconds to Mars. Oh, odd. So they were spectacular. They were definitely a ska band. I, I, I went to like the Warp Tour to see them. We've all been to the Warp Tour in our age group, I think. <laughs> there's like, there's. Well, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Like our, our like rough age group, there are people who. I would never think went to the Warp Tour. And they're like, oh, yeah, I went to the Warp Tour, whatever. <laughs> I'm like, well, did we just have to go? Like, what was the, we all just, it was something to do. <laughs> My favorite Warp Tour, I worked the Warp Tour in 2002, maybe. And it was at Suffolk Downs, which is a horse racing track in Boston. Uh -huh. And so because they had taken over the, the track for the day for the Warp Tour, there was no racing. And the table I was working was like right across from the T station where people were getting off. And I see, you know, there's all these punk kids and everything. And I see this one guy, like maybe 50 years old, like Adidas tracksuit, flat hat cap. He's got the racing papers. He's all like, God, today's my day. Gonna make some money. I know it's Listen gonna here, be. Yeah. He's all like, ah, I'm gonna, I know today. I just feel it. I'm gonna win this money. And he walks up to the gate, walks past all these people. And then he realizes, oh, there's no horse racing today and he literally crumpled the paper in his hand and went god damn it and <laughs> threw it down and then just got back on the train and i was like this was worth this is the best part of the warp tour i hate to say it probably was yeah it was that year for sure i remember just being sweaty and dirty all mm -hmm. day long because you know it's a not that i'm a mosh pit girl but i was you know in the periphery and it's just a dust bowl if you yes will. it was a dust bowl and i felt icky all day I didn't like it at the time, and now at, uh, at being old, and also after a year plus of COVID, I couldn't even imagine. Doing no, that. no, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah, like, I slept out to Paramus, New Jersey, yesterday for a for a outlet retail adventure, and uh, I stood in line for eight minutes to get into a Nike store. Did you get anything though? I I, I actually ended up getting um, some really sweet little like vintage style 70s sneakers never in my life have i waited in any kind of line to get into a retail store yeah that is Much bad less for sneakers that is bad that's one of those moments in life where you're like i know this i should who i am now yes this is who i am and i know i i, I could stop this right here i don't have to go through <laughs> with this but you will oh damn it god damn it this god Ken? damn it this phone what, what telephone do you <laughs> it's a red motel phone that I got. Yeah, it is. It's a bad phone. Um, and it's a whole long story where I, I thought I was being really cute when I got this phone. Did but, you need to get that? No, no. It's We have a landline and we don't need it, but it's cheaper to get the landline. With the bundle. <laughs> yes. And they're the like, elusive bundle. I don't understand why, because I don't understand how that makes them more money. But uh, Well, anyway. if you get rid of the HBO, it's going to cost $400 instead. Yes. Well, if you want less stuff, we're going to charge you three times as much. But why? <laughs> why? <Yes>. But why? <laughs> I uh, actually renegotiated my cable pretty recently, and it was remarkable. I'd been paying an astronomical amount. And uh, this is fascinating content. You're it, welcome. It's TV and, related. <laughs> <laughs> and I called and I called and I said, oh, you're on a you're on a legacy 
uh, Time Warner account. Time Warner was bought out by Spectrum like three years ago. And it never occurred to me to say, hey, this is too much. Yeah. And uh, they basically cut the bill in half. But this grainy video you see right here is the product of them saying, well, if you want this, you're just going to have to take it down at notch. Because <laughs> normally it, it just teaches you how completely arbitrary the prices are. Yes. <laughs> because like anything else, you're like, yeah, the sandwich, like I, I had to buy the ingredients. So like the minute this is the price, mm -hmm. and then, like, I don't know how Labor. much. You, what will we pay us? 300 bucks. Okay. Does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, 50, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what is yeah. money? What yeah, is who currency? Yeah, get as much as you can. You do a ton of voiceovers, though, too, right? For like commercials and all I kinds love of that. I love that you say a ton. That's really kind. Well, some, Should we end this here? That's it. Boom. Okay. Um, good night, everybody. Well, you have for like some notable stuff and people who have heard your voice and things. Yeah, I've had, I've had a, a lot of luck recently in the last couple of years. And uh, where are you going with this? Where's this? Oh, because when you call a customer service person, yeah, <laughs> do they ever recognize your voice? Oh, no. Oh, okay. No. I mean, would they say, are, are you are you the voice of that pharmaceutical thing I heard yes, earlier today? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, you convinced me that the side effects were not a problem. <laughs> I um, suddenly want to ask my doctor something. <laughs> So much like the Fairly Brothers film, you're growing up outside Providence. Yeah. Uh, which I think was probably the same year. I think it was like 98. I think it up. was. Yeah, yeah. I love that movie. It's not as Fairly Brothers as the other ones, I guess, maybe. Okay, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna probably put a, a firm halt on this on yeah. this podcast episode. I've never seen it. Oh wow. Have Can you I... seen any Fairly Brothers stuff? Um None that are memorable. Like something about Mary or any of those. Yeah, fine. But overall, nope. What are your what are your like go-to movies? Which do you have like a genre? Do I have a genre? Okay, if I'm flipping through actual cable, which doesn't happen anymore. Because um, you had to cut the you cut the bill. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was time, man. Yeah. <laughs> I will stop on the following. Shawshank, mm -hmm. Wayne's World. The Sound of Music. Okay. But usually there are far too commercials to bother. And uh, I'm sure I could come up with like eight more. But those are like, oh, I'm I'm here for the next two hours. You'll just stop no matter how many times you've seen it. You own it. But if it's playing, you're going to yep. watch it regardless. Notting Hill. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Notting Hill. Yeah. Have you ever been to London? I have. And I've been to the bookshop. You had to go to the bookshop, didn't you? Well, you know... <laughs> I feel it was an obligation. It was like, well, you're here. You have to go. It's not in kill. Live out your dreams. I always wonder if they name movies purposely of specific like neighborhoods and places, knowing that there will be people who will go visit those places because of that. Or that, and and knowing like, oh, I'm from I'm from there, so I have to see this movie. Yeah, so I can complain about it. Right. <laughs> No one ever is like, captures it perfectly. It's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, like the show Providence. You remember that in the late yes. 90s, early aughts? I mean, that was just like one single exterior shot that they had. And it, and I and I think everyone I knew at the time was like, this is friggin' stupid. You know? Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like Providence. <laughs> well, the, did they do, they shot Brotherhood there, I think. That was kind of, pro which is like a super mob, mobby, mobbed up thing. Mobby mobbed up. I'll be mobbed up. It's like Buddy Cianci, the TV series. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'm going to um, write this down. What's his, Ethan Embry was in it okay. from uh, Empire Records and he was- Oh yeah. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. He's, you, you don't recognize him at first and you're like, it's Ethan Embry. Oh, this is great. <laughs> um, but it, it's pretty interesting. That one they actually shot there, but yeah, I can't think of anything. I cannot think of a single movie that everybody's like, perfect. Exactly. <laughs> This is where Chef's we, kiss. yes. Uh, although God may be gone, pretty accurate depiction of Boston, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. Um, <laughs> but I will say outside Providence set in the seventies. Uh, if you grew up, uh, in, in Rhode Island, New England in the like early, you know, eighties, seventies, it feels very weirdly familiar. And it's like, like people's dads playing poker and drinking Narragansett. And yep. <laughs> like, it's just like, you're just like, Oh, okay. Yeah, I get it. Uh, <laughs> but it's not, it's not bad. Um, there was a weird little, I think something about Mary came out this year too, but anyway, this, we're talking about TV here. <laughs> um, Sorry. Whoa. I brought it up. It's my fault. 
Um, <laughs> Do your show right. <laughs> I make the rules here. This is my run. <laughs> Did you guys get TV Guide? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I actually, I had a friend in high school growing up, Jeff, who was obsessed with it. And, and it was like, it would come in the mail as though it was the Pulitzer Prize nominations of the week. And he'd be very excited about all the shows coming out. And then I, in turn, was excited because he just exuded excitement. And, Contact um, excitement. Amen. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and we got we got the TV guide, and it was it was fabulous. I loved the horoscope in the back. In fact, I read mine in the nineteen ninety eight version that you sent me, and uh, and it was like everything's great except it's not. Okay, bye. You know, was it accurate for that day? <laughs> Did you go back and cross reference? I, I went through my diary, and yeah, everything was great, but not. Have you ever seen that famous Amazing Randy experiment with horoscopes? No. Do you know who he is at all? No. Feel There's like a batting pretty it's well here on. <laughs> no, no, you, you're a real person who has actual things in their life. Um, <laughs> There's a great documentary about him. He died last year um, called uh, An Honest Liar. And he was this magician who started as a stage magician. And then after doing that for about a year or two, was like, oh, this is bullshit. I'm just full. I'm lying to people. I think what instead I'll do is uh, I'll just debunk criminals. <laughs> So he spent the rest of it. It's amazing. He used all this stuff he knew about magicians to like uh, bust like psychics and like faith healers wow. and like all these people. And for years he had this thing. It was like, if you can prove uh, the existence of like psychic abilities and he had like a scientific, like 10 point checklist. Like if you can meet mm -hmm. this criteria, like I will give you $1 million. <laughs> like this is exactly what you have to do. If you can do that million bucks is yours. Did anyone hit it? Nope. Um, and like he, uh, he debunked Yuri Geller, the spoon bending guy, uh -huh. um, on the tonight show. How do you, how do you, how do you prove you didn't bend the spoon? Well, magic cause spoon? so amazing Randy could recreate that easily. And I guess what Yuri Geller would do is he would do misdirection and then he'd bend it with his hand <laughs> oh. every time. But <laughs> he, <laughs> he used to do this thing where he was like, here are a bunch of, um, like those little spice canisters, the, like the little metal ones, they had, one of them had a ball bearing it or something. And he would do this thing where he would like put his hand over and be like, oh, it's, it's here, you know? And what Randy realized was that he was actually shaking the table just a little bit with his knee so he could hear which one it was in. So what he did was he put a little dollop of rubber cement on the bottom of each canister which if you were truly psychic would not affect it in any way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the footage is amazing. You can watch it on YouTube, but he's on Carson and you see him like he's all confident because he's done this gag a million times. And then he's like, um, something's blocking me. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and Carson was in on it because he was an old magician. And so he's like, all right, well, let's go to a commercial. We'll see if you can come, do it when you come back. And it's, amazing <laughs> but he did this experiment where he got a whole um uh, whole college co class and he he goes uh you know i've i i got all your birthdays I, I wrote all these horoscopes for you guys individually um so you know open your envelopes and read them everybody reads them and then he's talking to them he's like you know do you feel like that really got you and everybody's like oh my god it was so me like i don't know it was so accurate and blah 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 <laughs> this goes on for like 20 minutes he goes okay now take your horoscope and hand it to the person next to you and read that one it's the and same everyone had the same one <laughs> yeah yeah and it was like it, it, it it's it's really interesting footage because all the people are like <laughs> you know, just completely right. yeah um but i you know i don't mean to debunk horoscopes but i but i don't know why i went on that weird tangent but i love it well I've, I've gotten really into this app called co-star which has everything to do with television not at all um and <laughs> and apparently they use nasa science data nasa data they use nasa data to pinpoint your your time of birth your place of birth and somehow through the cosmos, they literally know that I spent last Saturday on the couch watching Netflix. <laughs> you will be at a Nike store in line <laughs> for eight minutes. Do you? Does it ever? Um, do you ever change your behavior when you read those? Like, oh, I shouldn't do this thing. Oh, I, I actually read the the sitting on the couch watching Netflix thing retroactively. I I was like, oh, you can go back in time. So I, <laughs> I saw the day before, and I was like, ugh. That's exactly uncharacteristically. I'm not a I'm not a sit around on the couch kind of a person generally. 
And uh, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? Weird. It was raining. It was a rainy Memorial Day weekend. And I spent half the weekend sitting on the couch. It was it was uh, needed. Apparently, I, I get yep. it now. I understand what the people like now. It's great. Yeah. You just sit there and then everything comes to you. And Weird. then eventually you just, everything atrophies. Yes. yes. <laughs> so let's dump, jump in, dump in here. Let's dump in here. Let's dump in here. Uh, let's jump Sorry. in here. This is uh, 1998. Here's the weirdest thing before we get to the listings here. I always mention the cigarette ads in TV guide because they're ubiquitous. Oh, I thought you were going to say that Romy and Michelle is on every single day during the week. That is hundred percent true. And I forget <laughs> how massive that movie was. And when it got on TV, it was one of those movies that they were like, we're going to make this a cult it, whether people want to or not yeah <laughs> i don't mind that movie <laughs> i don't mind it it's a fun movie um, i love lisa kudrow she's very fun i was actually talking about her the other day because she was a groundling mm -hmm. um and she didn't get snl in 86 or something when laura michaels came back mm -hmm. and was like devastated and lorraine newman and cassandra peterson and all these people were like it, it's gonna be better you're gonna you, you would have been you would have hated it there and then obviously i foresee in your horoscope you'll yes. be making a million an episode on a show called pals <laughs> yes or acquaintances or something um <laughs> coffee yes, shop chums something. um but there's an ad in here for winston yeah I, I recall scrolling by it. My God. Uh, is it the voting one? It is. So like, number one. What? Why, why, I, it's not For the people at home, for the people listening at home, it's a black and white image of a voting booth from the 90s. So it's basically like a glorified uh, bathtub with a shower curtain in front yep. of it. And it says, vote 98. No additives. No bull. Because mm. number one, we're in a midterm too. This isn't even a presidential election. <laughs> oh wait, this is a full page situation. The other, the other side yeah. of the of the of the booklet, if you will, the bowl stops here. Which doesn't help. No. <laughs> that doesn't make it any more clear as to why it's tied to voting. We went Bush after that, no? Yeah, but that was what? even two years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not even an election year. It's like a midterm. Like I don't know how they pitched this. Who approved ad. this? Like, guys, all right, you, you've heard bull, right? People mean it. They mean what bullshit. What do you say? Uh, listen, listen. <laughs> okay, but if you continue on, um, it features Scream. It features yes. Drew Barrymore from Scream. Mm -hmm. I remember watching this in my living room with my friend Nicole, and my mom was hanging out. We had a slumber party, Nicole and me, at my house. And I do not like horror movies. Just no thank you. <laughs> not my cup of tea. Don't need it. And but it was the thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, OK, we'll watch it on pay-per-view, I'm pretty sure. Or we went to a blockbuster and picked it out. Don't remember. One of the two. And I watched 97 percent of that movie from behind my hand <laughs> in front of my eyes. And about a year or two ago. I was coming home from I don't know where and I was flipping through Netflix or whatever and scream came up and i was like okay it's been like 20 years i wonder if i can handle this movie and meanwhile at the time my mom watched it and you know the the whole beginning of the movie is drew barrymore being brutally murdered yes <laughs> and i could only fathom what was happening to her on screen but i would not watch it so i had this image of my mom for two decades of just being this hardened <laughs> cold like able to watch any kind of hideous violence human being so i came home about two years ago and was like i'm gonna know about this and i flip it on and i actually watched it from beginning to end and like cackle laughed because i had no idea it's comedy it was it was uh silly business yeah. you never saw a thing the anyway. sound effects though are really effective in that scene <laughs> No kidding. It's like, like real wet, gross. Oh, yeah. Um, so just here, you did yourself no favors by just hearing it. <laughs> it like made it so much worse. But I mean, like I, I called my mom and I was like, I just watched Scream. You're not the horrific person I thought you were. <laughs> She's like, your image of me has been, has been scrumbled. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> nah, you're, not, you're not as brave as I thought. Uh, but I love that. Movie. I remember I saw that. In the theater, I just got my license when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I got up early on a Saturday morning and I drove to the Liberty Tree Mall in Danvers. And I Freaking saw that. Danvers. Danvers. How old I, are you? Uh, I turned 41. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this month. Um, 
And Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Um, although I'm counting it as my second annual 39th because it's yeah, locked down. Yeah. Um, When's your actual birthday? June 28th. Oh. My cancer. My cancer. Oh, um, right. More ways than uh, appropriate name, uh, cancer. Um, <laughs> I think it's unfair to cancers that our sign is the only one that's also a disease. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there another one that's funny? I don't know. There's no, none of the other ones are diseases. <laughs> Isn't there the, the, the gonorrhea one? What's the, no, I'm kidding. Am I kidding? <laughs> Isn't there another one that's strange? Well, you got like Pisces, cancer? uh, Libra, Taurus. Twins. There's Twins a, Twins is you know, the, the Gemini, right? Yeah. I don't know. There's no other diseases or. We'll cut this. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's not fair. It's not Mm-mm. fair. I'm uh, so sorry. They, they should all be diseases. <laughs> <laughs> Ask your doctor if Sagittarius is right for you. Yes, yes. So either get new diseases and name them <laughs> or change those names to existing diseases. I'm in the 13th sign. Are you familiar with this? No. The, and apparently it's bullshit, but uh, apparently uh, the science people say that actually Sagittarius isn't the full 28 days or whatever. It's really like... 26 and a half so there's like a four day period or like an 11 day period that it's like a fake non unrecognized horoscope sign. so just this like mystery horoscope in the yeah, middle that's me hi oh that's pretty good you're like the mystery flavor of I'm nothing. Uh, I'm, of I'm, dum-dums. I am nothing with the with the back of 17 <laughs> magazines horoscopes it or makes are me very you sad. everything oh can you pick anyone <laughs> and apply uh, oh huh? Opening up uh, new world. Yes. Um, but so I went and saw it in the theater. I saw the first screening on a Saturday morning. I was the only one in the theater, and which was kind of awesome. <laughs> um, was it? I, well, I, I love Doesn't somebody get murdered in, in a theater. Uh, part two. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that with a full theater, though. So that wasn't as bad. Um, but I loved it. And I remember telling everybody how great it was. And, and then it became a big hit. But my friends were like, oh, it, that doesn't sound fun. And no one went to go see it uh, on my recommendation because no one ever did. But I, I got it. it was the first DVD I bought. Like, I loved that movie. And I don't think I've watched it since 1999 <laughs> you're not wrong <laughs> yeah it's not that great yeah it's very of its time yes yes it's got a real dawson's creek vibe <laughs> <laughs> which even i wasn't into back then no. it was like prime dawson creek age i was a my so-called life girl my favorite show of all time <laughs> really oh it's the best it's it, the best. It, it, it truly is the best. It and this may be. Uh, see if you had the same experience. This may be because we, we grew up in the Northeast, and I don't. Even though that show's set like outside Pittsburgh, I think. Yeah. The neighborhoods and just the kids and all the all the the vibe of it felt like where I grew New up England. more than any yeah. other show. Yeah. It looked and felt, and I I don't know why. <laughs> The, the awkward parents who didn't talk much. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> yes. Uh, it helps. It helps that it was like all Boston bands on the soundtrack. <laughs> um, and they go see Buffalo Tom. Uh, Julian Hatfield's a ghost in an episode. <laughs> but right. still, um, I, in fact, the last time I was in, or ev- almost every time I go to California, I go to South Pasadena and the street where Angela's house is and Brian Krakow's house is across the street is right there in South Pasadena. <laughs> So when I had my podcast, my uh, it was called Latchkey Kids, and then I I have great appreciation for people who put out podcasts because it's a huge amount of work. It is good on you. Thank you. Um, but one of my favorite guests was uh, Senta Moses, yes, who, who played Delia in later episodes, and she was the most charming person. If I lived in LA, I'd be ringing her bell for coffee. And uh, unfortunately, there's an entire continent between us. Yes, okay. I love Cindy. She was actually one of the last in-person guests I had on this show. <laughs> last really? Time I was out in LA. Yeah. Um, and I've talked to Wilson about doing it. And I've had Juliana Hatfield. On. Actually, Juliana sat right there. Uh, and we talked about that episode. And it, it's so weird having been on the actual street. Because I love going to like shooting locations. Yeah. Because it looks like California. <laughs> Have you <laughs> ever been to Palm Pioneer trees. Town? No, where's Pioneer Town? It's in California, IA. Uh, it's uh, where they would shoot the silent films, um, and and they've preserved the exteriors, and you can walk through, and it's like the old saloon, the bank. okay. So it's like the Western Town. Yeah, yeah. It's 
unbelievable to pass through. And it's and it's like popula- Pioneer Town is like population 17. Right. So you feel very much in it. I'll have to go the next time I go out, if I ever go out again. Um, but my, I, You will. I have faith in you. Hopefully. It's my favorite place. Um, weirdly, the My So-Called Life House is one street away from Pee Wee Herman's house from Pee Wee's Big Adventure, around the corner from Andy's house from Pretty in Pink, okay. <laughs> and two streets over... <laughs> from uh michael myers house from halloween <laughs> wow that's a mixed bag it's quite a neighborhood <laughs> um, but yeah i love that show it's just although have you read the my so-called life goes on book no does it so, come in the dvd no no there was there was a, a quite a significant amount of literature in this in there the DVD is, box set which i even have not ever read and i love that show yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not reading this big booklet. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that tonight. <laughs> Too many words. Too many words. Uh, there's a novelization that uh, Winnie Holzman didn't write, but like wrote an introduction to and sort of oversaw. But mm-hmm. it supposedly they took the Bible for season two and they wrote this novel. <laughs> and oh it's my goodness. everything that was supposed to happen in season two. And I read it and I went, kind of glad we didn't get a season two. <laughs> Because I don't want any of this to happen. <laughs> they get divorced. It's a terrible thing. Oh yeah, like uh, like uh, Jordan Catalano and Rayanne get together. They but get they div- did get together. Like they become a couple, and like it's a, a whole thing. And then like yeah, the parents get divorced, and it's just like really depressing. <laughs> um, I had the absolute great pleasure to be published in McSweeney's comedy anthology, humor anthology in 2018, 19, um, 19. And my piece was Angela Chase, age 39, uh, from My So-Called Life, announces her bid for Congress. (laughs) And I wrote in the voice of her 15-year-old self from the show, now 39 years old, running for for Congress. And they put it in the book. And to this day, I'm still like, wow. (laughs) <laughs> it's real it's real it's canon <laughs> <laughs> and um and during that time it was before the election and i had big hopes and dreams that claire danes would reprise her role and do this as a push to get people to vote because the whole piece kind of ends in vote and um i had this unbelievable interaction with winnie holtzman via email oh wow and uh she could not have been nicer and we corresponded for a little while, and it just wasn't going to happen for varying reasons. Uh, Claire Danes had just had a baby, apparently, and uh, it just wasn't going to happen. But she was so kind, and I had an opportunity to tell her how she she really wrote my teenage years so succinctly that those horrible aching feelings of of like being stupidly in love with some awful person <laughs> yes who's, who's not right for you at all not right for anyone for anyone <laughs> except for Anne graf and uh and and she was just very kind and and i i'm still utterly floored that i even had that experience it's crazy right that we've like are able to sort of reach through the television and sort of have <laughs> it see us you know what yes. i mean like as kids who grew up watching that sort of thing <laughs> yeah. um amy sedaris told me an amazing winnie holzman story where um have you ever seen strangers with candy here and there yeah um super funny but like just dark as dark gets and mm-hmm. way off kilter and when they started that show amy tried to hire Winnie Holzman to show run with her because we had just got off my so-called life. And she's like, yeah, we want someone who does teenage shows. So they heard Stephen Colbert send her the script for the pilot. She was like, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> it was like, never contact me. I'm not me putting again. my name with yeah, this. Just stay far away from me. <laughs> like, this is so, I don't know what is what your deal is, but no, uh, which is just the best. I just love everything about that. Um, so don't read. My so-called life goes on. I won't. I won't. Thank you. Stick I will with, watch uh, all those YouTube videos you mentioned earlier, though. Yes, they are very good. <laughs> uh, um, I always loved, I sort of cracked the code on how to write dialogue for my so-called life when I was 14. And I used to like to do my so-called life speak, <laughs> which was like my <laughs> version something. of pig Latin. Yes. You take the noun out, the proper noun out, you replace it with a generic article and add or something or or whatever to the end. And of you're any crossing sentence. your arms and you're touching crossing your face. Crossing your arms, yeah. And you're and you're covering up the imaginary zit on your chin. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And like tugging at your shirt. Like I'd be like, uh, 
this doesn't sound right. The microphone or whatever. Whatever. <laughs> and it's, it's that's like everything. a microphone. Here's our inner thoughts. <laughs> so you get the existential and part back exactly who we are. But is whatever. that how we sound? Is that or my something? voice or something? Uh, poor Brian Krakow. Um, so let's dive in here because I'll t- I'll <laughs> okay. keep you all night. I'm sorry. Um, we're on That's Saturday. About it. We're on Saturday night, October seventeenth, nineteen ninety eight. What are you going with? We're like a week out from Halloween. You're killing me here because you asked me to stay within prime time. But if there's however, something that's interesting, feel however, free to go. Yeah. Mystery Science Theater 3000 starts at 5.30 p.m. And I'm, I'm just not going to miss that. Big fan of MST3. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was it was a unique uh, one of a kind show. They haven't made a I know they're coming out with a new one, actually. Right. But um, they had the, the second iteration of the new one is coming out soon. And then they they're, they're like one of those bands that have two competing versions of the band. Mm-hmm. touring so there's riff tracks right. which is the guys from sort of the second iteration and then the mystery side theater new one which is like original guys plus new people <laughs> it's the drummer the new class the new the class keyboard. yes it's it's msd3k the new class <laughs> yeah. um but i love uh, that show too but if we get into but if we get into prime time i'm going talk soup weekend Unfortunately, it's not the Greg Kinnear era. It's John Henderson. But I'm not sad about John Henderson. He, remember, he had that strange little gray spot on yeah, the side little, of his head. Like he saw a little bit of a ghost once. Yes, yes. He um, <laughs> he touched his tongue a little bit to the electrical socket. Yes. Something something happened there. And, uh, and that brings us to 9 p.m. And, uh, you know, the thing about the weekend, I feel like all of the programmers at the time were like, everybody's going out we just need weird children's shows and uh feel good programs like touched by an angel um touching john henderson by an angel and uh and there's nothing really good on on the weekend i had a really hard time with it so i'm going with breaking away at nine the movie the movie the movie I'm about settling in for a movie the bike racing team it's bike yes. racing right yes with attractive dennis quaid which was a four-year period between breaking away <laughs> and the remake of doa um, inner space being right in the middle there sure uh and that's a movie for some reason uh, everyone i know who loves that movie which is a handful of people are women all women love that movie um and not just because it's like cute boy alert movie like they really genuinely isn't. love it and and it's just like it's like a serious heartbreaking movie about a bike team yeah they all get together and rally and learn how to ride and help their friend and something about jumping off a rock into a lake or a quarry <laughs> or something but last summer the summer of doing nothing my husband who's about 10 years older than i you know we're not going anywhere because we're dead in the middle of covid uh we got into the fabulous habit of watching movies i'd never seen because i did not grow up in the 70s and he yes was, and so he's like you ever watch brad news bears or paper moon or ha- big hand for a little lady i'm like no i'm i'm no uh and so that was one of them and i was and at first i'm like i don't want nothing to do with this program you know sausage fest yeah. and then it turned out to be a spectacular movie is that the the one you like the most out of that series of 70s movies you've never seen it really was, was. yeah yeah i've never i there was a tv series of breaking away for a short time as well uh in the bad news bears um which i've seen more of that than i have with the actual movie and for some mm-hmm. reason it's the same thing i think those was the group in the 80s we have this like physical revulsion of the 70s <laughs> Which I think is like genetic. Like you have to, like the generation before you have to be like, well, I think the eighties is being hideous. Yeah. Now, but at the time, (laughs) or do you like the nineties kids are like eighties, you know, like it's the the generation before you, you have to kind of be like revolted by, uh, otherwise you'd never move on. Uh, like I have, uh, (laughs) sure can. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) As I I sit in my very eighties room. Um, so I just never watched that movie, but I, I, someday I will, uh, uh, although if not now when, when? uh cuz hey um i want to mention that martial law is on <laughs> <laughs> look out what uh, page are you on so i am on uh 8 p.m. on saturday night uh on at wpri tv <laughs> um <laughs> this is saturday night cbs america's night of heroes 
which is a really loose interpretation of the word heroes because they're going with one early edition. Uh huh. If you remember that show. Oh, yes. Something about a newspaper, but it's magical. God sends this guy tomorrow's newspaper. Every yes. Day. Brilliant. <laughs> and Brilliant. he has to help people or keep things from happening. Martial law is uh, Sammo Hung, who is uh, a, a massive star in China, Hong Kong star, started in this group called the Seven Little Fortunes with Jackie Chan, amazing martial artist, uh, huge director, producer in Hong Kong. They gave him a cop show here <laughs> sure. where he's just like a Chinese cop and everyone thinks he's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and so a, 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 we're talking America. That's like the quintessential cab driver saying I was a cardiologist. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's Simo Hung. He's like a, an accomplished director. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think it's funny. That's America's night of heroes and he's super Hong Kong. Um, and then all new Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> yes. Yes. I actually noted that in my, in my preparation of this evening and I'm amused by Walker, Texas Ranger. Like, who would have thought some, you know, what is he? he it's not Kung Fu. What does he do? Uh, Mar he's some karate, martial, who like straight who karate. Yeah. Ca straight karate. Who would have thought, who would have thought that he would go from, you know, t Texas Ranger saving the day. This particular episode, uh, he's defending against pollution and, and Native Americans. And he would later become such a shitbag Republican. He always was. So he, here's my favorite Chuck Norris story. Um, who wrote Chuck, who wrote this? Who wrote Walker, Walker Texas, Texas Ranger? Ranger? I'm it sure it wasn't him. No, no. I'm sure it's like lefty Hollywood writers and he had no idea. He just doesn't. He's not that smart, first of all. <laughs> um, <laughs> he just kicks things. He just kicks things. Uh, my friend Molly Hagan, who is in election and uh, she's been in everything. She's the best. Mm -hmm. she, her very first movie was a Chuck Norris movie. And I think it's Code of Silence. They shot it in Chicago. She, she grew up in Chicago. And she plays the teenage daughter of like a mobster that gets murdered. And so Chuck Norris has to put her into like protective custody or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> she's like 17, I think. So they're shooting this scene and she's in, in bed and she's crying. She's really upset about her father, um, you know, having just been murdered. And Chuck Norris is just like, okay. <laughs> like leaves the room and the the script direction was like you know he sits on the bed and like comforts her right yeah and so she's like no you have to sit on the bed and like you know like like comfort like you know or else your character is going to look like an asshole and chuck norris leaves the room mm -hmm. and then the d the director comes in and goes we're not shooting today and she's like what why so she goes back to her trailer and she's leaving and they're like why did you call chuck norris an asshole and she's like, I didn't call Chuck Norris an asshole. I said, like, his, if he doesn't, they'll think his character is an asshole. And then the director goes, Chuck doesn't see a difference between him and his character. <laughs> so <laughs> she, she, wow. she, she had to apologize to Chuck Hyper Norris. Hyper method acting. <laughs> Chuck Norris as. Yeah. Texas Ranger like, as. Oh, my God. Um, but I was like, that's very Chuck Norris. Uh, you also have Flipper, The New Adventures. Which I have zero interest in. <laughs> as a as a person who loves television jingles, on my podcast, I would close out every episode asking the guest to deliver a dramatic reading of a television jingle, and boy, did they deliver! <laughs> and but no one did Flipper, and I don't think I could call Flipper to my. Everyone loves the King of the Sea, ever so kind and gentle as he, Trixie. He'll do when children are near. Oh, I do know it. Wow. Um, but anyway. Uh, I could I could get down with some flipper because I was a latchkey kid. I, it, this was interesting because they re, they brought flipper back because Free Willy was huge. Well, that makes sense. It's no the Armageddon to uh, other end of the world movie that came out twenty minutes later. Oh, uh, Armageddon and um, it was a meteor. It was uh. Ah, oh, damn it. I can't remember what it is, but I know what you're talking about. And yeah. the two volcano movies. Yes. <laughs> They're always, <laughs> Lava always concurrent. One. Lava yes. two. Or when Lombada came out at the same time as the forbidden dance and both movies opened <laughs> the same weekend. <laughs> what to see. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a really short lived show here uh, mm -hmm. on at eight o'clock, uh, which NBC is really trying with this one. And this is not work. They go NBC Saturday Thrillology. 
I don't even know what that's supposed to mean, but this is the series premiere of Wind on Water, not Wind on the Water, Wind on Water. Wind on Water. Which is extremely cool and extremely extremely hot. hot. And it's sort of like a teenage extreme sports Baywatch type situation. It's like if Magnum P.I.'s cousin, according to this man with a prominent mustache, and Marlena from Days of Our Lives' cousin also had a program. The There's a close-up. On the beach. On the beach. Bo Derek is in it in a cowboy hat. Uh, and it has a, a, a close-up with a longer explanation. But I prefer the smaller explanation here because it's perfect. In the one sentence, it says, The saga of surfing cowboys in Hawaii. <laughs> Yes. So, what is the hell is a surfing cowboy? And if none of this is for you, Romy and Michelle is on. Romy and Michelle is on every night. <laughs> Tonight if, at nine. Tomorrow at nine. Yeah. Also at nine the next day, Romy and Michelle. They used to do that in New York. Channel 11 used to do a thing called the Million Dollar Movie. Mm-hmm. And every night for a week, they'd play the same movie at eight o'clock. Because pre-VCRs... It would be like people would go, oh, I love that movie. I'll watch it tomorrow. Like it would, it did really well. <laughs> it's like a really bizarre uh, programming thing. Didn't Rhode Island have dialing for dollars? Dialing like, for dollars. There would be show a movie time. and they'd like call someone and be like, are you home? You won this money. I vaguely remember seeing that as a kid. You know, someone showed up at my front door earlier campaigning for a politician r- running for mayor. And the idea of someone calling me up saying, are you home? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's back to scream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it all comes, full all comes back to scream. Yeah. It was a thing where they, I think it was like a franchise. They did it in different cities, but they'd show a movie and then the interstitials, they had like a bingo, you know, thing and they'd pull out numbers and then they'd call like a random citizen. And if you answered the phone and we're Hello, watching citizen, yes. Is this a citizen? You'd win like whatever, a thousand dollars or something. I remember watching it like one summer in Narragansett. Um, <sighs> With my grandfather. <laughs> oh, memories. Oh. Uh, <laughs> there's also a really bad t- TV movie <laughs> with Dennis Rodman in it. And it's... <laughs> Where are you seeing this? <laughs> oh, my God. It's a, it's a Saturday night, at, <laughs> page 95, at 1.35 a.m. <laughs> oh, that's why I'm too early. <laughs> there's a show produced by Jerry Bruckheimer, producer of Armageddon. And it says it's called Sof. S O F. S O F. That's the name of the show. And Our pages stands, aren't lined up the same way. Uh, it stands for, it's on the same page as the uh, 40 years of classic TV video ah, the set page. offer. Um, and it's, it stands for Special Ops Force. <laughs> and it's Dennis Rodman fighting. Who is he fighting? It doesn't even give you a, anything about the show in the listing. It's just someone named Malone. Moses Malone, Malone versus Rodman. Oh, the reason why I'm, I'm looking for it in the listing. It's the massive, massive. Uh, okay, it's three quarters of a page. But nevertheless, it's 135 in the morning. Why are you doing a three quarters of a page ad? That is massive. Okay, what's the deal? What's the deal? 135 a.m. Um, TBS. Was it TBS? TBS time. Five. Yeah. Why? The, do you the, know? Can I do. you solve my age old mystery? I can. The, so Ted Turner, who was a pretty smart guy, um, had the brilliant idea that if all of his shows started on the five, that people would never turn the channel because when the show they were watching ended, all the other shows had already started by five minutes and they didn't want to, they already missed the beginning. So they just keep watching TBS. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that checks out. It's pretty brilliant. Uh, if you get one show they want to watch, you got them. <laughs> so make it a marathon. That's right. That's right. It was sort of the drug dealer uh, <laughs> idea the of first shows. five minutes are free. Yeah. Okay, and you're hooked. Where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna go? Who else are you gonna watch? You missed the beginning. You don't know what's happened. Come to Plot me. Gone. Yeah. Uh, so that's on Ted Teddy's Turner. lap. <laughs> Teddy's gonna tell you who a superstation is. <laughs> So, uh, so Sunday, if we get Mm -hmm. into Sunday, I'm taking the reins here. Yes, please do. Sunday again, weekend programming is garbage, Mm. garbage. I tell you. Um, but I did land on sister, sister because I loved that show. I I do like that show a lot. (laughs) 
I don't know what they're up to today, but I hope it's something great. Tia and Tamara, uh, one of them hosts one of those. Uh, you know everything. I know, but it's useless. You know everything. It's useless. Is uh, it? You <laughs> have a of, show. That's true. Uh, one of them hosts. It's not the View, but it's like the View, like the Talk or the Gab or like one of those other mm-hmm. View like shows. She's mm-hmm. one of the hosts, and then the other twin hosts a cooking show. <laughs> It's actually no like a fun cooking show on like Food Channel or something. Huh. Um, that's very fun. Um, and even though it's before eight o'clock, I did notice that speaking of Flipper, mm-hmm. Baywatch that day mm-hmm. is See, about a boy. I was never interested in Baywatch, believe it or not. You'll be surprised to hear. <laughs> you might be interested in this episode because <laughs> it's a very special Baywatch. It actually says that in the ad. I'm, and I'm pretty it says, sure they all are very special. The miracle of life penetrates, poor Whoop. choice of words, a, a young boy's silent world. And this is an episode about an autistic boy okay. who becomes friends with a dolphin. Do you know this episode? I do know this episode. Ken, what the hell? <laughs> because it's Baywatch, and they tried to do like a, we're going to win an Emmy on this one. <laughs> Did you see the, one, the 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 clip going around on Twitter a couple of months ago of like it's Mike Piazza who comes on the beach saves a woman and and she's like hey are you Mike Piazza and he's like yes I am I'm I play baseball and then he just puts his arm around her waist and they walk away and and everyone's caption around that clip on Baywatch was like if you don't think you have it to be a TV writer think again oh yeah no i'm like we would we would just be the kings of hollywood in the 80s and 90s you could write any <laughs> kind of bullshit you wanted oh, but i'd like to point you. out i'd like to point out on this baywatch ad i'm really impressed by this in 1998 www.baywatch.com what do you oh, think yeah. that website looked like at the time i'm thinking like uh really slow loading uh jpegs <laughs> one red bar bathing <laughs> yes. suit at a time uh, pam anderson running on the beach mm-hmm. and maybe like a 10 second wave clip of david hasselhoff singing <laughs> that's <laughs> really like crackly and no audio yeah <laughs> you have real player um, <laughs> uh and there's also a remake of uh oh no it's from the producer of the thorn birds and roots trying to do a huge made for tv will miniseries. of their own which I was like, is this a sequel to A League of Their Own? No, they're no. in Victorian gowns. Yeah, yeah. Pants. <laughs> it, but it's Greg from Dharma. And Gre- this is what I found interesting about this program. It's like an ABC, CBS, NBC mashup of stars. Like, mm-hmm. I sort of think of, you know, Angela Lansbury was um, on the MGM lot. She had her contract with them. That's who she worked with for X number of movies. You know what I mean? And um, so I was surprised to see that Leah Thompson, Caroline in the city, Caroline in the city, Caroline, yep, in, the Caroline city. in the city, and then and then Dharma and Greg and then Eric McCormick from Will and Grace. It's just a it's a cross network extraordinaire. It is. It's a superstar cast. Uh, someone told me I look like Thomas Gibson once and I was like, I don't I think can so. see that. Really? I can see that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't remember this at all. And, you know, Faye Dunaway's in it. Ellen Bernstein, Sonia Braga, like there's big names in this. And uh, I don't think it's beloved. <laughs> That's a different show. <laughs> beloved, is I believe. A different you, show. I believe you meant to pronounce it beloved. Beloved, totally um, different program. It's true. Uh, so you're watching that at eight, and then what are you watching after that on Sunday? Oh, Sunday. Yeah, still, I'm. Uh, I'm not super happy about Sunday's programming. <laughs> There's addicted to love with Meg Ryan, and then I also marked down Emma's wish tonight. Her wish will come true. Is the tag. Um, It's somewhere in here. A heart tugging fantasy in which a senior citizen played by Joanna Kearns. Right. (laughs) Who's like 40 magically becomes 40 years younger. Mrs. Seaver. And and what is it? And something sets out to write her relationship with her estranged daughter. Della Reese is in it. Seymour Cassell. Uh, This sounds terrible (laughs) yeah and i would watch that purely for the mystery science theater 3000 home edition the old this is terrible the old age makeup they've put on joanna kearns looks exactly mrs doubtfire it looks exactly mrs doubtfire exactly like mrs doubtfire (laughs) like to the point where i'm like did they just have leftover mrs doubtfire makeup call the makeup artist who did mrs doubtfire (laughs) we want the same thing she looks more like robin williams than robin williams does looks like robin williams <laughs> it's awful uh 
and I'm not buying Joanna Kearns a 75 year old woman. <laughs> Great actor. She directs now. Uh, mm-hmm. is very successful as a director. She sure is. Um, I that. Poor Joanna Kearns. Uh, <laughs> Monday, what'd you do? In the COVID times, I um I wrote a Hallmark movie. I wrote a screenplay because one had time. Yes. And um, it was the first time ever writing a script of such long format. And so it's probably garbage. But anyway, um, in my mind, Joanna Kearns was the mom. And then I looked her up and it's like, oh, she's busy doing better things now. <laughs> She's to, very nice. Like I've I've talked about doing sure. this show, and she's super busy. But she is like the quintessential sitcom mom to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love Growing Pains so much. Who doesn't love Growing Pains? Season two and three, fantastic. And then all the good writers went to just the ten of us because Kirk Cameron was insufferable. Oh, uh, that's fair. <laughs> um, I had Tim O'Donnell on the show, who show ran uh, Growing Pains for a while, and he's just got the best stories uh cast matthew perry in his first thing and leonardo dicaprio on his first thing yeah luke brower the runaway boy that they took in he was the uh he was the at a kid Lives. actually chrissy was the at a kid on growing Tank. things and then he was the at a homeless boy he was the at a homeless boy he was the uh he was at the, an orphan at an orphan yeah he was the uh sam different strokes at an orphan um <laughs> he lived in the janitor's closet <laughs> That I don't remember. <laughs> That's where Mike, he was the smartest kid in Mike's class. And then Mike discovered that he lived in the janitor's closet in the school. <laughs> It was like, I'm going to adopt you because that's a thing uh, that you can do. Um, my God. <laughs> come come <laughs> with me. You yeah. legally live with me now. How long have you lived in this janitor's closet? Says here. <laughs> 28 you, I, years. You can be my son now. <laughs> um, that's how it works. And that was also Chrissy having aged like seven years over the summer because they were like, she's Did a Did they baby. bring her she's back 10. as a different actor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, she was who played her. She's very popular now. She does that, um, that online D and D thing. And I can't remember her name now. No idea. Um, but she's like super popular from that. Uh, yeah, they did that. They, they fast forward aged her just like Andy on family ties where it was like baby. And then seven, <laughs> <laughs> no one mentions Ooh. the six years that happened <laughs> between <laughs> no character development. <laughs> um, so is this movie being made? Oh no! Okay, it's uh nobody's read it. Okay, me. yeah. Is it, a, is it a holiday Hallmark movie? Oh yes, well, I went through a weird phase, uh, maybe two or three winters ago, where I just couldn't stop watching them because they're so bad. Good, mm-hmm. they're not good at all. Let's no. be clear. But um, but there's but they something seem to know it. My husband and I had an ongoing thing where we'd sort of like place verbal bets of like dead mom, dead dad, um big city wanted to be a writer so i wrote i wrote a thing for uh, a parody piece for the bold italic a couple of years ago of uh, from the perspective of the hallmark executive producing team and how to how to write your own hallmark christmas movie and it's just a rundown of like a checklist of things you must include i gotta tell you the number of emails i've received from this of like Hi, so I've written a thing and I just want to pass it by you. But are you sure about and I'm like, no, no, it was a j- it a was joke. a joke. This is a joke. I've dashed a lot of dreams. I feel awful. <laughs> well, I mean, what else are you gonna do? String them along till you green light it? You're <laughs> gonna be funded in movies. A friend of mine directed a bunch of terrible sci-fi channel movies. I used to work for the sci-fi channel. Oh, did you really? It was my um, very first job out of college. What did you do at sci-fi channel? I was a glorified data <laughs> entry girl. Like scheduling? Yeah, I did uh, promos. Oh, nice. I did scheduling for Cartoon Network right out of college, um, which is the same kind of thing. Um, But you may be able to confirm or or confirm this, although I'm 99% sure it's true. Um, I'm going to deny whatever it is. I'll deny it. They watched the movie Dog Soldiers, which is a pretty good movie. It was a movie made by Neil, I forget his name, Um, but it was a theatrical movie that they got the rights to and aired on Sci-Fi Channel. And Mm -hmm. it got the best ratings out of any movie they aired on Sci-Fi Channel. So what the executives did is they had someone go through and just basically what happens at all the time codes. (laughs) And then they made a checklist. And they give that to everyone doing a monster movie on sci-fi channel words. And it's literally like, it's broken up by the commercial breaks. So it's like commercial break three, need to kill someone with a monster. I actually seem to remember there was a, there was a, a number, like a kill number that you had to reach. 
I don't know if this was an official thing, but I remember the developing guy saying like the kill rate is a little low for this. I don't think we'll be able to move forward with it. And, and like he would literally sit in his office watching these movies and uh, to acquire them. So those and, are uh, pre-made. He'd be like, oh, this isn't violent enough. I, I don't know if it was so much violent. Well, I'm sure there was more to it. I'm sure there was like a level of psychological science behind <laughs> it because he was great. He was uh, he was a fascinating dude, and um, and I can't remember his name, but he was wonderful. And I just specifically remember dropping something off at his office, and he's like, "Do you want to watch a few minutes of this crazy movie?" Yeah, sure. And he's like, "The kill rate is a little low," and I'm like, "That's good for me." <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to watch it. scary. Thing. I can't yeah. watch Scream, so which is hilarious that you worked at Sci-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. You know, it was like you throw your resume and see what's see what six. Um, yeah. But it was funny. I know what I want to be when I grow up. It's Me perfect. either. I have a few. I have a few years to figure it out. Um, they, they literally would be like, "Give us a funny name, <laughs> come up with a monster, and then as long as you follow this checklist and it's under this budget, we don't care." They had mosquito when I was there. Mm -hmm. Half man, half mosquito. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like if you just come up with that name and as long as you follow the checklist, they're fine. And I, I have to imagine Hallmark probably has a similar thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's broken up into, I, I found an article online of like, um, the following must happen. It's, it's eight acts. This happens in the first, um, I noticed in watching them in writing this piece that the almost kiss happens at the hour and 15 mark, give or take. It's like, oh, but I couldn't. Oh, I have yes. to go. Oh, it's snowing. I have to go. <laughs> we almost kissed one. What would mother think? <laughs> I'm a big city lawyer. Where's she lawyer. here today? <laughs> you own the Christmas tree farm. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Somebody always owns the Christmas tree farm. <laughs> a lot of Christmas tree farms in the Hallmark world. Yeah. Um, so, I think that's all of Monday. Uh, let's do Tuesday. Let's do Tuesday. Um, I do want to mention while you're looking, Ally McBeal is on Monday. Mm. That was in Providence, I think. No, it wasn't. I think it's supposed to take place in Providence. I think you're wrong, wrong, wrong. Because Boston Legal came after that. That was a spinoff. Was it a spinoff? Yeah, I think. Now, I, I almost never look. If it was in up. Providence, I would have tucked that away in my little Rhode Island heart. I know. I uh, Let's see. David E. Kelly said it. All right. Hold on. I, I almost never look things up, but I'm like, no, it is Boston. You're right. Yeah. Stick with me. Oh, well, what, are you, what are you going to do? Oh, you look of, it up. I'm thinking of Crossing Jordan. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember that. That I think was a spinoff of Providence. <laughs> oh, you're right. It's Boston. I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. You're Tuesday night. It's a big night for me. I'm watching Mad About You. I loved Mad About You, and I loved when they brought it back about a year and a half ago. It was spectacular. All the writers seem to just pick it up where they left off. You got so many of the same characters again, twenty something years later. It was like, oh my God, they brought the super Mr. Wicca back. Yes. It made me so happy. Um, I found their daughter, Mabel, insufferable as an infant when they brought her on because it was like, oh, the show's ending. Um, and then as an adult, she was annoying too. But um, I loved I loved Mad About You. It's a great show. I It holds up still. Like it's, It really does. There's 390 shows that I always say are, I, I think no one ever agrees with me on this, but... I loved Seinfeld when it first aired. Mm -hmm. It was innovative. I cannot rewatch it. It doesn't hold up to me. Once you know the plots, like the surprise isn't really that funny anymore. And yeah. the characters are so unlikable and it's so 90s. Like I recognize it was great and I just don't enjoy rewatching it. Whereas News Radio, Spin City, and Mad About You. I can watch all day, every day. They seem mm -hmm. really timeless. They're pure character dialogue shows and they're really funny. <laughs> no one ever agrees with me on this. <laughs> I'm nodding and smiling. Yes. But I don't know if I could great. get behind news. I, I have news radio on my list, but meh. It's very good though. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll give it a shot. What about Frasier? See, Frasier, I have a real problem. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'll tell you why. You hate uh, people from Seattle. Hate Seattle. Uh, really hate uh, just anything to do with the psychiatric industry because I'm a Scientologist and I'd like to talk to you about Thetans. Um, <laughs> no, it's, I love Cheers, obviously. Like Cheers yeah. is perfect. And Spectacular. it's so Boston um, and just amazing. Cheers and was one of the highlights of this pandemic in my house. Watched it from the beginning and it was
it's shot like a play. If you ever watch it, it it's sort of like it, the, if they never moved the camera and they just did a wide shot the entire time, it would it would play out perfectly still. Yeah, it's perfect. And it never got bad. No. Well, it, he did hit Diane. And that's when I was like, OK, I'm done. Well, yeah, but that's a that's a bad character. Like you don't like the character or like what happened there. Like but, fine, but, fine. But the quality of the show was still good. Was like, it, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't do that thing where, and it never got super weird. Like most shows that run more than five seasons, all of a sudden start getting like really bizarre because <laughs> they've run out of everything to do. Uh, you know, they replaced two major characters and they were still really good. Oh, you'll like this as a Mystery Science Theater person, uh, Joel Hodgson, uh, who I've had on the show. He was offered the a role in Cheers. <laughs> before the person who got that role was in the role and they got that role because joel turned it down <laughs> and he guessed the person was woody harrelson <laughs> oh no way they offered joel that part <laughs> and he was like no <laughs> good <laughs> which is correct he he was right it would have been terrible <laughs> um and woody harrelson was perfect but the Frasier on Frasier and the Frasier on Cheers are two different characters. <laughs> very much so. Very much so. And it really bothered me because the stuff I loved about the Frasier on Cheers was that he was an alcoholic and, um, you know, kind of a sad guy. And that great equalizer of a doctor is there with a mailman and because they're all alcoholics. Yeah. You know? yeah. And that totally was just like, forget that. And just, he was not the same character and I didn't like that. <laughs> It bothered me. It was like a reboot that ruined your childhood kind of a thing. Sort of. It was like, I know why you called this Frasier, because there's a name recognition, but... There's a guy here who happens to be named Frasier. Yeah. It's it's a different show, so like, call it something different. Yeah. Um, but I, And I could never get into it because of that. Fair enough. And I'm missing out because everybody loves that show. <laughs> hey, that's, a, that's okay. You're going to be okay. I believe right? in you, Ken. <laughs> I'm watching uh, Just Shoot Me next. I could never watch that. You know, it's weird. I really liked um, David Spade. I liked his character. And I think a lot of it had to do with my own high school era of insecurity, that I liked his sarcasm as his defense mechanism. And between that and Murphy Brown's kind of shittiness, yeah. those were the weird TV walls that I took in to build up in myself. And uh, we're getting, we're getting, you don't, you don't like anything psychological, but here we are. Um, no, I love psychological stuff. I need it. Um, oh, I mean, no, I mean, psychiatric. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Like that, that, that wish fulfillment of you're like, man, I wish I could like, just say that kind of stuff to people like that kind of thing. No, I was a sarcastic shit in high school and, uh, and it was like, I saw it on TV, so it was okay. Oh, so and it's validation. I suppose. Well, uh, I mean, you know, every kid is insecure in high school. Yeah. Ish. Except for, you know, that one douche. Every and kid who's worth anything is insecure <laughs> in high school. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> and that that was my way of kind of getting through, you know, the awkward moments of of being and existing in my teenage self. And uh and I regret it. I kind of look back on it and cringe because it's like, oh, sometimes you're a little bit, you know mean and i didn't want to be in retrospect but i was just but it's protective know. it's protective and also like i think that um like you're very smart i think a lot of people that in high school who were a little smarter or like a little more worldly than the rest of everyone else go on go on they they <laughs> you you develop a sort of i'm better than this kind of thing and you're kind of but you don't know how to process it and sort of actualize it as a kid because you can't go anywhere you can't do anything like you're kind of trapped i like where you're going with this and that does make sense yeah i mean i listened to your episode with bonnie H hunt this I afternoon love bonnie so much oh my gosh and there should be a club for her right let's start a club for bonnie hunt why isn't she whenever they're like women in comedy women like she never comes up and i'm like she's and amazing she's spectacular yes but i but i loved her her she made a point about murphy brown kind of being a a turning point in television at the time where before it was sort of like everyone's in on the joke together and then murphy brown's writing was sort of being mean to others and and out for yourself and i think she really succinctly uh voiced how that kind of changed the way people are you know my 
my my mom talks about like working in customer service and she she was like you know it used to be you could have a conversation with a person on the phone and, and deal with whatever issue they were having and there was some point where people became indignant over anything and it was she says it's around the like mid to late 90s people mm -hmm. became and she's like we talk about this occasionally and it's like what happened you know was it the internet was it I don't know, the news kind of shifting in a weird way. I don't know. Like, what changed in the world to make people feel like they could just scream at somebody on the other side of the phone, you know? There's a, I think there's a lack of, well, a lot of things. I think one thing I always, my, my socio, social theory about mm. one of the reasons that uh, politics became so polarized uh, from like the 60s on is because it sort of directly correlates with the rise of televised national team sports. <laughs> and oh. everybody kind of got this like sort of group team mentality with also a mixture of, it's not that I want my team to win, I want your team to team lose. To lose. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a different thing. Yeah. And I think it's a mixture of that, a sort of lack of empathy as we sort of moved into the cynicism of the post seventies, uh, world where people were almost like too sincere, started looking at sincerity as like a, uh, a negative a quality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, or like a weakness, um, in that sort of wall street eighties, like greed is good kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then just a mixture of all of the, sort of media input we have, which would include the internet as well, that sort of dehumanizes people on the other end of a device, whether it's, you know, someone you're watching on TV or dealing with on the phone, they're not, people started separating how they interact with people based on the format of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was like, you wouldn't say that to somebody's face. And they're like, no, I'll tell them on the phone. <laughs> like it was <laughs> what's the difference right right so they started like compartmentalizing that stuff because they're safe behind the device yeah mm -hmm. it's yeah. not on like twitter it's not on like you saying getting death threats and oh yeah uh, yeah yeah exactly yeah it's it's people don't and then i think that whole thing too with like that rise of the alt-right kids and stuff that that all to me is a, a total um a lack of consequences so living in a world without consequences which really is sort of what the internet spawned where you can be in like a chat room with people of your own mind and you're used to playing a video game where like the character dies and then just comes back or like you know like no you go, consequences yeah it's just it's it's not a consequence you know it's just like reset yeah. um so it, you know it's that kind of weird like oh it's just kidding whatever it's a joke you know um and we started to get those shows with very unlikable lead characters who are very selfish and instead of us and out for themselves and out for themselves, which when we had a show like that, which Buffalo Bill was a show like that with Dabney Coleman in the early eighties, which is an mm. amazing show. Uh, Joanna Cassidy was on it who, uh, won a golden globe for that show, uh, who I've had on the show as a friend. Um, but people hated it because Dabney Coleman, who's like, so good at playing an asshole yeah <laughs> played yeah. a dabney coleman character and people were like i hate this guy yeah. and it's funny because you watch it now and he seems really nice compared to like even the seinfeld cast what we see yeah but if you look at the contemporary writing about that show they're like who would want to watch a show about a bad person <laughs> but it's interesting you know like when i start a new show if none of the cast are likable characters i find it hard to watch that's why i couldn't you know, watch like mad men I mean, that's a, that's a good example. It's, it's, it's kind of cringy. You, you're worried about everybody in a weird way, but at the same time you don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, I, I'm not rooting for anyone here. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like the peril they're in, I'm like, well, yeah, you kind of deserve that, mm -hmm. but not even in like a, yeah, you got what's coming to you away. Like on a twilight zone episode or something, yeah. you know, I mean, what comes to mind for me is girls. Yeah. I, the I, little I saw that I couldn't deal. I, and I actually, I ended up getting really into it for a little while because, well, I don't know why, but, um, but it dawned on me, like, I do not like a single person on this screen. There is not a single person I would ever want to spend any time with. Um, so it took me a lot. I was like way, way at, past the fact of enjoying the show. If you right. it, was, it wasn't so much enjoying it as watching a train wreck. Yes. Yes. You know? You're just like, I can't not watch it. <laughs> the people say, so I have to know. And. Well, there was also like a shift um, in the mid nineties where, and this was driven by re 
when they started getting the ratings to a microcosm and they could figure out exactly who was watching stuff and like mm -hmm. what to the minute. And number one, that's when they invented tweens, decided that was a marketable right. uh, age group. Number two, they figured out- I was out, never a tween. I wasn't either. We were the last Damn generation it. who didn't get to be tweens, um, which is a thing. It's funny. Like there was a generation that didn't get to be teenager. I mean, they didn't invent teenagers to the fifties. You were a, a child and then you were an adult. And then marketing was, hey, teenagers a thing. But like, if you grew up in the forties, you weren't, you didn't get to be a teenager. Yeah. Now um, I'm a geriatric millennial. <laughs> geriatric millennial. Um, but they discovered that like tween girls were the most profitable group to market to. Yeah. And they kind of started just wiping media of blue collar shows, of shows about uh, struggle and made everything aspirational. Everything. It, it, it became you know, like all 90210 kind of stuff. Cause they mm -hmm. were like, you know, 12 year old girls want to be 18 year old, rich girls. <laughs> it was basically their sort of mentality. And that sort of approach. I think, I think 35 year old girls want to be 18 year old, I rich think, girls. Hey, 41 year old men want to be uh, 18 year old, <laughs> rich girls. Um, but it, it, instead of being like a Roseanne type show where it's like, they're funny because life is awful and they like need to get through it. You know, they mm -hmm. might lose the house. It became like either aspirational in that we want to see people who are just rich and like have fuck you money basically right like that fantasy uh aspirational in that you see people who have a bunch of money but you just want to see them fail <laughs> so like that the reality shows and then this weird aspiration of like untethered id of man if i had i could just say whatever i want to anyone <laughs> and it became like this weird like cancer is too strong of a word, but like a weird taint, someone much smarter than me could elaborate on this much more, but that's the, the sense I get of when things started to shift, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in that aspiration piece and as part of it, like aspiring to be able to be an asshole <laughs> basically. Yeah. I, I, I want the whole world to just rewind on that. I don't want to go back. Don't get me wrong. Right. Uh, but you know, like, shows that are kind i'm watching Anne with an e which is Anne of green gables right now it's it's pretty cheesy let's just get it out there but it's also inspiring and heartwarming and and not in a cheesy way not in a touched by an angel kind of a way right. in a in a in an incredible acting kind of a way i mean they're spectacular and I never read the books. They mean nothing to me. I don't know where the story's going. It's just that I'm charmed and everyone has won my heart. But that's what we want. Like, that's like one of the shows I've gravitated towards is Somebody Feed Phil, if you've watched that at all. It's Phil Rosenthal who created Everybody Loves Raymond. And he's just this like super nice, rich, affable Jewish guy from New York. And it's a reality show where he just travels around the world eating food and complimenting people. That's pretty much that. the show. That sounds great. And he's such a good dude. And he's so like enthusiastic and like, like good job in people. And yeah. it like, yeah, <laughs> like, that's what I want to watch. You yeah. Know? Or like least, Samantha Brown. I don't know if you've ever watched yes, her on the show. Yes. She's, she's also just, just such a bright light of positivity. I want that option at least. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want everything to be the worst possible things that happen to everybody all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. but that's just me. Um, Wednesday, what'd you do? Wednesday, I'm watching The Nanny. I like The Nanny. What do you mean? I like The Nanny. Well, the it, Nanny, she was working in a bridal shop in Flushing, Queens <laughs> till her boyfriend kicked her out. Oh, it was one of those crushing scenes. What was she to do? Where was she to go? She was out on her fanny. So over the bridge of Flushing, okay, the Sheffield's door, she was there to sell makeup, right? But the father <laughs> found more. She had style. She had flair. Oh, Ken, she was there. That's how she became the nanny. Is that the last show with a exposition theme song? <laughs> I can't think of one after that. Uh, or even a theme song at all. <laughs> there's got to be many, many, many more. I mean, <clears throat> there's Friends. That That's a, that's pre-nanny. Is that pre-nanny? Well, you would know. Well, contemporary um, with the nanny. Um, right. But that's not like a let me... The pilot of the show is the theme song. <laughs> is, you know what I mean? <laughs> is 10 lines. Yeah, it's like Fresh yeah. Friends, Gilligan's Island kind of thing. Um I it was 
I always liked it when I watched it, but it wasn't a show for like a 15 year old boy, you know, I like went through it, a weird phase in eighth grade. I want to say that I, uh, I would always talk like the nanny <laughs> and uh, it was my weird alter ego. So yeah. if people didn't like me, it wasn't because I was a jerk. It was probably because I did that. They hate Fra Fran Drescher. That's the problem. I mean, who could hate Fran Drescher? That's true. She is very charming. She does Hallmark movies now. She does. It's weird seeing her in serious roles. <laughs> like she pulls it off, but it's, it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, it was again, a show that like, if it was on, I'd watch it and enjoy it, but I wouldn't ever like go out of my way to watch it. Um, and it's a show that like, it hasn't quite, there is a cult audience for the nanny, but it's not like golden girls level. I think it might, it, I feel there. like it's my so-called life level. Yeah, probably. There's, there's like 18 people in the United States who are like, yes, the nanny, <laughs> the people who love it really love it <laughs> really love it and i'm one of them yeah I love it's the nanny. a lot of the cast members of those were doing a lot of conventions uh before in teen before the world ended um oh, it oh was no. it was a weird uh it, like randomly because normally it's you know like sci-fi horror stuff but then it was like the cast of the nanny um and so why not there's an audience for it at the commercial break flip over to dharma and greg i love jenna elfman for some reason oh I, well for, i mean keeping the faith my god that was a spectacular I like that. movie townies was amazing i don't know if you ever watched townies i vaguely remember townies yeah it was her and molly ringwald ron livingston bill burr and they're oh, all yeah. living in gloucester and they're gloucester? like sad poor people <laughs> and it's great and um what's her name's on it from gilmore girls uh curly Lorelei? hair yeah, whatever that actress's name is. Uh, I don't know. Um, I can't think of her name. But just amazing cast. But but Jenna Elfman's so good on that show. Um, her cameo in Can't Hardly Wait. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Danny Elfman's her <laughs> uncle-in-law. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> Which actually means Bridget Fonda's her aunt-in-law. <laughs> A lot of information in that yeah. brain. Um, but yeah, it's uh, she's been married to Bodie Elfman for a long time. Um, and a uh, famed Scientologist. Yes, big. You should time cut that so they don't knock on our door pretending to be running for New York City. Yes, her, her and Kirstie Please. Alley are going to show up at my house and kick my ass. Oh my God, uh, they're, they're going to hook up an engram thing to me and and fry my brain. Um, yeah, but she's been in that for a long time. Uh, weirdly, for some reason, but. She definitely was one of those people that were like, we can, she's a movie star. And then it like, didn't take. <laughs> yeah. It's a shame. Uh, I don't know. Because I, I thought keeping the faith was, was just a wonder. She's so charming, gorgeous, comedic timing, right on, on the money. Well, anyway, Thursday night yeah. is a big night for me. You what get your got? friends, you mm -hmm. get your news radio, which I would not watch now, but that's just what was on. And there's not much else. Um, Frazier, getting back to that, and Will and Grace. It was the third. It was must see TV. Yes, and uh, it was must see. You really had to see it. If All you didn't see it, it you must. You have. didn't see. <laughs> um, but this was sort of a weird era of it because Seinfeld wasn't always on. Like the original sort of must see TV, which was Cheers anchored it, and even like the tail end of Night Court. Uh, and it sort of shifted. We get we also get two guys, a girl at a pizza place the night before. I should mention. I I, I marked that down as well. I kind of like that show. I uh, did too. Took place in Boston, um, not Providence. Um, but I you you just watched must see TV. Like there was no question on Thursdays, even yeah. if you didn't like the shows, you just watched them <laughs> because everybody watched them. And then you go to school the next day or work, I assume, and and it it'd be the uh, the water cooler. Talk. Gotta go with the water cooler. What happened on Friends last night? Oh my God! You see Joey? <laughs> what was he thinking? Uh, oh my Jesus! Different Joey. Yeah. Um, although that would be good uh, if they recast him midway through the season with Joey Lawrence. Um, <laughs> and then weirdly, ER, which I know is outside the purview here, but not a comedy. <laughs> um, super heavy. Super heavy. Terrifying. Terrifying really well done and is in a category of things i i call excellent show never want to see it again <laughs> yeah yeah i i have uh i have scenes ingrained in my mind that i'd love to just pluck out that are yep. scary mm -hmm. devastating a accident <laughs> and a man lost his leg and for whatever reason uh they couldn't give him anesthetics because he would have bled out and anyway 
that is seared into my brain. Yeah. And and I think that episode was like 20 something years ago. Oh yeah. And, yeah. Uh, anyway, if you know a good therapist, let me know. <laughs> if you know a good therapist who specializes in ER removal, <laughs> uh, please contact Sarah. Um, but yeah, it was always a weird, but it was always a weird transition because you're watching like comedy, 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 and you'd watch ER after, and it was just like getting punched in the face. <laughs> it was like you leaving your birthday party, and someone's just like, boom. And Give me oh your my money. God, my nose. Um, but you're like, but good hit. That was a really good punch. <laughs> Um, really well done squarely done yeah but it worked Precision. for some reason <laughs> which they haven't tried to do since then like they've they're very very cognizant of making each night one genre now it seems like it's like this is the courtroom night <laughs> this is the comedy night i mean i haven't watched like most people i assume i haven't watched cable a cable lineup in years if you I wouldn't even know what's on anymore. I don't so much either. It's more when I turn my TV on to before I press the streaming button and mm -hmm. whatever is on <laughs> the channel for that two seconds. Huh. For me, it, it, it defaults to New York one. So I have no okay. choice but to, to learn some stabbing, shooting, break in fire. <laughs> Maybe that's the show. Maybe that, I don't know if that's scripted. Tonight at New York One. <laughs> New York One tonight. Uh, guy gets his leg cut off and he can't have anesthesia because he'll Whoa. bleed out. Stop it! <laughs> so Friday night, what'd you do? Friday, again, getting back to the weekend. The, terrible programming. I'm begrudgingly watching Pee Wee Herman. Not even Pee Wee. Not even Pee Wee's Playhouse. Just nondescript Pee Wee Herman. Yeah, I didn't know what that was. I I think. Let me see. What channel is it on? It is I think it was on HBO or something. HBO. It's oh, where are we here? Oh, and I think geez. it was it was maybe his uh, uh, theater theatrical. Oh, the special from 1982, the original PB Herman show. Possibly. Which is kind of great. I I wore out a tape of that that I used to rent as a kid. Wow. <laughs> um, because I just loved it so much. Um, pre, let me see if it's an hour long. That's what it is. Uh, where am I here? scroll 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 uh viva poor elena um hbo point break monster in the closet that's actually a really fun movie uh Pee Wee herman Pee Wee goes through a typical day at his house yeah it's on comedy central it is this is the hour-long original Pee Wee herman show okay i'm in um, i'm in which, have you ever seen it i don't think so it's great it's great it's the history of that is amazing which i won't bore you with in its entirety but basically paul rubens much like um uh, Lisa Kudrow didn't get SNL from the Groundlings in 78. He was so pissed off. <laughs> he was like, I'm going to do my own show. Fuck you. And so he created this stage show at the Roxy in LA. And it became this like huge underground, like musty show. He was doing it every night for like a year at this thing. And he got the HBO special. They basically just filmed the show mm -hmm. and then got the deal for Pee-wee's Big Adventure from that. Uh, and so it's, it's, a little bit like Playhouse, but it's very adult. Phil Hartman is in it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it. It's just fun. Like it makes me, I have a great affinity for that era of Los Angeles with that sort of new wave punk rock, weird art movement, kind of <laughs> like downtown loft, you know, <laughs> like style. And it sort of has that, all that vibe to it. That whole vibe. Yeah. It's, it's very fun. My backup was uh, Sabrina, the teenage witch, which I was wholeheartedly into in my youth because as you may recall she learns she's a witch on her 16th birthday yes and i was about 16 when i was watching it and it was like oh here's my time and that's because when you i was an idiot you were a witch <laughs> <laughs> um, no, i don't but, think you mean that in the same way <laughs> but also that show so created by nels cavell who's amazing nels the mm -hmm. best um and had a really cool sort of hip cast like dana gould was on it i mean we we're just uh, talking about jenna elfman she would have transitioned into that show beautifully oh yeah as, she a, as, great. A, as an aunt they didn't know she had or something yes. you know caroline um, ray's really good mm -hmm. uh, joel hodgson was on that show penn and teller were on that show everybody was in that uh, show. a lot of mst3k people wrote for that show uh, so it had like kind of a cool weird vibe to it and yeah. uh after season three when she moved out of salem and moved to boston to go to college uh, they showed her on Newberry Street at Newberry Comics uh, coming up from Condom World. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> so the, the Newberry Comics on Newberry Street, which is the original location yeah, yeah. Uh, that Amy Mann used to work at, um, 
it's like a like a two up two down kind of store so there's like a, a store underneath it that's mm-hmm. a condom store called condom world but in the opening credits they have her walking up those stairs so they can get the freeze frame of like her in front of the newbury comic sign mm-hmm. and the only reason you'd be walking up those stairs is if you were coming from condom from world, condom world. <laughs> and so as a kid i just thought that was the funniest thing because <laughs> i'm like okay that's cool that's cool <laughs> wow <laughs> she really grew up i mean she's in college now um but not a bad choice that's that's another show that every time it's on i'll watch it and enjoy it i was really into it and i was really into that sort of witchy the craft era you know like big big on purple at the time and velvet mm-hmm. and uh chokers and um i i i part-timed at the local cinema the b-run cinema and they had the leftover uh trailers and it was on celluloid and i'd take a whole bunch of them home and i actually made curtains out of them which is absolutely a fire hazard oh my god but you would have been my best friend on earth for that for that alone <laughs> i'm like they this were... girl's the coolest person ever <laughs> picture like venetian blinds but film yeah and um my mom hated it because it provided zero uh warmth, light protection <laughs> light protection warmth of any kind smelled <laughs> they didn't smell okay What's your on your film? Sometimes film, like if you keep it in the sun, like you'll get like a chemically smell from the emulsion. Uh, never. Uh, it, it was a short lived thing because eventually okay. my mom's like, "No, you're killing the heat here, yeah. kid." Um, New England, yeah. and uh, anyway, so my room was very much a, a Sabrina the Teenage Witch inspired space for a while. But weirdly, it's a show about witches that's not super gothy. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. It's very uh, cutesy high school. Did you watch the reboot? It was creepy, wasn't it? Yeah. I didn't watch it. No, like I didn't watch it. It's pure horror. It's like, a, it's not a sitcom. So going back to like an hour ago, no. <laughs> it's it's very much more like the craft than Sabrina. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And there's a the debut of a show called Trinity this night, which is billed as from the producers of ER. <laughs> and I don't recognize any of the cast in this show. This like seems like a cursed show. Um, and I think it's like about firemen. <laughs> so it's like trying to be ER, but firemen. Uh, it's, it, and it's the most generic ad ever. It literally says, from the producer of ER comes the next great American drama. Fire time. That's it. Like, doesn't say anything else about the show. Like, they had to make the ad and didn't know what the show was about yet. Like, just <laughs> Entirely put, possible. Put Great American Drama. We'll fill it in later. Uh, oh, shit. It's due. Um, yeah. And it just, it says, Bobby risks his lieutenant's wrath by working on a case not assigned to him. Amanda learns she's pregnant. Fiona meets an old friend. Okay, Liam well, was given hey. a bag of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hooked. I'm uh, so sorry. And Millennium is on, which I loved. I don't know Millennium. Millennium was sort of a spinoff of the X-Files, and it was about mm-hmm. a serial killer profiler. Again, not up your alley, I'm sure, at this time. <laughs> um, but the second season got more comedic, and like a lot of the writers went on to write for like Buffy and Angel and a bunch mm-hmm. of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was kind of a cool, weird, really weird show. I was surprised it actually got on the air. I never watched Buffy, but I watched Charmed, be getting ready for work in the morning. It was on TBS at mm-hmm. like 7.30 in the morning. I kind of love that show. It's real dumb. It was great. It was so stupidly great. But it kind of, again, Nell Scavell actually created Sabrina wrote for Charmed as well. (laughs) She left Sabrina to do Charmed. Um, But it it, kind of knows it's a stupid show. And just kind of like, yeah, we know. <laughs> We're leaning makes, into this. Yeah, You're exactly. welcome. Um, and, and that's another show that I would never seek out, but when it's on, because it'll be on for like four hours on TBS. Right. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'll put this on. It's fun. Starts at 8.05. We're making it a marathon. Yes. Now I'm stuck all day. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the week. Anything else in there that we missed? No, no. We have covered my entire life. We got everything here. I hope everyone started this podcast on the five. Um, so now you have to listen to my podcast and only my podcast forever. <laughs> um, but are you bringing yours back at all or are you done with the podcasting? Uh, a weekly cadence didn't work. Mini series? Limited run series? Limited run series, yes. Um, six episode series. It really, I, I had six guests and it was spectacular. I had I had a... Uh, Tim Long from The Simpsons, longtime writer producer from The Simpsons. I had um, brilliant Senta. comedy writers. I had Senta, uh, Marcus Strickland, who is he. 
when he hits it, he's going to be incredible. I have read his writing. I've read his scripts. He is spectacular. If you don't know Marcus Strickland, um, Greg Baldwin, who plays uncle Iroh on avatar, the last airbender. It was a, it was a good run. Yeah. And, and the great thing is still easily available, still easily available. I'm thinking of, uh, there's a number of people with, uh, the name Sarah Sweeney, both of them together. And, uh, I thought it'd be cool to have uh, just a micro episode of like five or six Sarah Sweeney's. Tell them, tell me about yourself. What's there's your several, world? There's several Ken Reads as well. Uh, Surprising. one is a dead Scottish cartoonist. Uh-huh. One is a hockey writer in Canada. Mm-hmm. And one is a right wing politician from Virginia. Uh, and I've told the story before, but you may appreciate this, uh, who I occasionally would get emails for mm-hmm. that I would always answer. And one of my emails was quoted in the paper in Virginia from Ken Reed about the teachers who were striking. <laughs> I was like, oh, they can go and fuck themselves. <laughs> and so. <laughs> He was so mad at me. And I was like, what do you mean? They asked me for a quote. He's like, well, obviously they weren't asking you. I'm like, I don't know. I thought they wanted a comedian from Boston. <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, he they was didn't like, specify. Yeah, uh... he said, we want a quote from Ken Reed. Well, I'm not going to question them. <laughs> and, uh, he was so mad because it was like a big news story down there where they're like, uh, whatever he was. I forget what his like, uh, <laughs> alderman and congressman Ken Reed tells the teachers you need to go F themselves. Oh, <laughs> and so it was that was fun. That's um, way more interesting than, than the Sarah Sweeney interactions I've had. Uh, I've, I've, for a while, one is a dermatologist in Texas, and and she was getting these invites to do panels. And I'm like, you got the wrong girl. You know, <laughs> I, I feel like her career is crumbling because you know, you put a, the, the initial in the wrong spot or something. And then another woman, I kept getting an email from her pastor. She was getting married somewhere in West Virginia. And the pastor was like, here are the here's the rundown of your wedding. And I'm like, nope, wrong Wrong, wrong person. Send her my love. There's a guy named Dave Gorman, who's a British comedian who mm. did a show called Are You Dave Gorman in like 2000 at Edinburgh. Yeah. And it was literally him just contacting every Dave Gorman he could find. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hilarious. It's really great. There's probably well, clips of it on YouTube. Uh, I didn't realize I'm stealing the idea, but I'm no, stealing the idea. Steal that idea. He's, he's But English. I mean, the po- podcast wise... No, it was it was fun. I I enjoyed it, and I, I realized you know there are other things that I want to do. And uh, right now, I'm really focusing on. Um, I mainly do commercial and uh, like a lot of internal voiceover, and I want to shift over to animation. I have this I have this reel I want to put to good use, and um, so I'm seeking out seeking out representation. I know some people. I'll oh, you know some people. I know some people. We'll and talk. Uh, so that I would love it actually. And uh, so I'm, I'm focusing on that and and writing. And I mean, I mentioned my Hallmark Christmas yes. movie, but I'm working on other things as well. And so I want to, I want to expand move your forward, <laughs> expand my horizon, move forward with uh, you know my creative in- endeavors, and uh, and it'll be good. Well, I think this podcast appearance will serve as a scared straight for you to never do podcasts again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm sitting in in my closet. The air conditioner is off, so you don't get that background noise. You can visibly see me sweating so my sorry. non-existent balls off. <laughs> so sorry. And, um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you enduring that. Thank you. That was Sarah. Again, hey, Sarah Sweeney, uh, H-E-Y. It's not hey, like hey, horses eat, which would be weird if it was hey, Sarah Sweeney. So she would be like a like a scarecrow version of Sarah Sweeney made out of hay. Uh, I, maybe I have heat stroke. That's why my brain is doing this. Um, so it's hey, Sarah Sweeney on Twitter, and she's SweeneyProject.com for all of her other stuff there. I'll also put links directly up on all the social media and on TVGuidanceCounselor.com so you don't even have to Google it or, or type anything in. You can just, you can just click from there. Uh, speaking of clicking, uh, if you want to message me, you can at Kenneth W. Reed and at TV Guidance, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode here. Thanks again to all our patrons. We have some new ones, and I, I am always amazed when we get new signups. Thank you so much. It really does help me uh, with producing the show, and you know, I do it anyway for you, but it is a huge help when you uh, get involved. 
Let me know if there's guests you want to hear. Uh, I always try to get them. I don't always succeed, but I will at least try. And uh, if I know them or not, and so message me and I will, I will do my best to make it happen for you. Uh, don't know. Maybe we'll go back in person at some point. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I may go out to LA in October. I'm, I'm kind of uh, just uh, waiting and seeing. Doing a wait and see. So we will wait and we will see. But I'll be here next week for a brand new edition. So I hope to see you then for that brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. I'm not really going anywhere with this story, but 